Hi there, welcome back to the blog and today I'm delighted to be in the company of Simon Strange who has written a, a really fascinating looking book called Blank Canvas. Um, hello Simon. Hi, how are you doing Gerard? Right, I'm good mate, yeah, all good. good. Thank you. Um, good. Yeah, really fascinating book. As I was saying just before we sort of started recording, I saw the blurb for it on a website and there was one bit in particular which I'm going to read that um, really struck really sort of stood out to me which it says does modern day music education suffocate the soul and inhibit the impact of the bohemian artist which i think is quite a quite a <laughs> fascinating and moot point i would say all um, my all my ex-employers will love that by the way as well wouldn't they? <laughs> cool. um okay so i normally start these things in fact i always start these things by asking you a little bit about your background um about you know perhaps growing up or further education or whatever kind of life experiences brought you to the point of writing that book I guess so mm. can you tell us a little bit about how it all began yeah well I'm I my parents my dad actually just died this week actually which is like oh dear I'm sorry yeah but he was he was 87 and he was he died peacefully so it's kind of like it's a celebration really more than the you know yeah um, but he was uh, he was a euphonium player and he played with the Salvation Army. His dad was an organ player in a church. And I think my mum was also kind of like, just a, they're both singers. And so my dad was in the Bournemouth Symphony Chorus. Um, so they were, I was brought up with this kind of classical um, background. And they, I, so I played piano and I kind of took to playing trombone when I was really young. But straight away, I was also born in that era. I was born in a lucky era. As my 18-year-old daughter says, you were born in the best era. Free internet, just when that explosion of subcultures really took over. So I was born in 1967. And I think I was born the week that um, uh, Sergeant Pepper was released. So it's kind of... Yeah. I feel like I had Sergeant Pepper coming out of my head, actually, because with the bra stuff and the kind of pop stuff and the creative experimental production. So I think I followed all those kind of elements through through my um, career. But as I've always been into music, so I I've just really kind of played in all kinds of areas of music. I've played in orchestras, I've played in jazz bands, I've played in big bands, brass bands, but then I was in punk bands as like a keyboard synth keyboard player and i i was in i'm actually re, a lot of my old bands seem to reform so like every so often there, there's a reform reformation on my old band so there's one reforming on sunday which is like um, a hoedown kind of <laughs> hillbilly band um so basically i've had a really really eclectic i had a naturally eclectic music thing I, and i think because of my environment being around music but also the teachers that, that I had and I think that's the same for a lot of people if you have the teachers that really inspire you at those young ages then you kind of you kind of follow that so I remember at school there was a really good jazz teacher so we played a lot of jazz and it was just in that period of, of punk as well my brother was a year older and he was into the damned and the sex pistols and I think I was like a year or two bit too young for punk in a lot of ways so I was like 10 when punk really hit but um yeah so I, th those kind that kind of mix of music upbringing and styles really informed what I've done in music and what that book came out of and really that book came out of all of that it came out of my PhD at Bar Spa but it also came from those experiences as well really were you a professional musician I don't know what that means but I think <laughs> getting <laughs> Did, did you uh, earn enough money not to have a, a job? Was that, I suppose. Yeah, but I think that's the whole point at that time. You could kind of, you could do it, couldn't you? I think that's one of the points I make in the book is that in the 70s, 80s, you can, there was squats, there was funding for, there's, you know, you could go to art school and get a grant and that was more than you got on the dole. So a lot of kids from council states would try and get into art school because they, that was a way of getting more money as well. Um Record companies had more time. I think I was, I definitely had, a, I've had a, through the end of the eighties, through the nineties, I lived in Paris as a musician playing. Oh in man, that's pretty impressive. I've got to... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Well, yeah, it was. Yeah, I think I was. I felt like I was dreaming most days. I didn't have lots of money, but I I lived as a musician. I lived a life as a musician for like three years. So yeah, yeah. I think that's yeah. I've been a producer as well, so I've been a professional record producer. Um, so yeah, yeah. At different at different points, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, you lived in Paris as a musician. That's just yeah. kind of fires off my imagination, truthfully, and also the sort of romanticism. Yeah, it was. It was a really weird. I always think back to the moment when that happened because it was a mate and I. We both bought like um, well, we bought a camper van together, and it was just like we had really good jobs in London, and we just like one day decided to leave, <laughs> and it was the last minute. We packed our instruments, and we ended up kind of like busking around Europe. And then ending up in Paris and getting seen by, I was just spotted by someone in the street who was in a major band in France. And they just said, you want to come and rehearse? And I basically joined the band like that afternoon. So, um, yeah, it's, yeah. If you wrote a book like that, people wouldn't believe it, would they? It's, I know. Uh... To be honest, my next book includes includes this. So, yeah. Oh, <laughs> I'll make a note not to believe it then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 i think it's the yeah i've always wanted to write the book that i'm writing i really i really like the book that i wrote but i really enjoying the book that i'm writing which, what's that one about the new one then it's a it's about it's really about that it's about my di different music journeys and different scenes but how i was not necessarily a major part in those scenes but i was a part of major scenes so it's part of the paris punk scene part of the glasgow um indie scene part of the bristol sort of trip hoppy scene part of the london jungle scene part of the the bristol eclectic scene that followed um trip hop so it's being being knowing musicians and being in these scenes and being part of the interconnection but not actually you know being a famous name yeah is really what i'm interested in and so it's my own personal journey i can write about myself and interesting stuff you know my own stories but i can also I'm going to interview the people I was I was around basically, and just kind of see what they remember and what they feel about the whole the whole thing. So that's a really eclectic, yeah, collection of of sort of scenes to be in, isn't it? Really more more than most people I would suspect. Really. Yeah, but I think that's always I think that's because I had that when I was grown up. I think I'm naturally I'm a trombone player, really, and you can play trombone. You know, I was brought up playing ska and reggae and funk as well as the orchestral stuff and i still i and i played latin and i was in a you know i was in a punk band as a trombone player i'm in a hillbilly band as a trombone player so it's like you can, what, you can... <laughs> what was the punk band on us i must ask the punk band i can't tell you what their name is it's too bad really bad <laughs> It's not anybody I'd know then. No, 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 not that one. No, the but the one in Paris was called um, Chihuahua. They were part of um, like Manu Negra and Lena Gressvet. So two of the sort of main bands in Paris. They were kind of like offshoots of that. And they used to be part of um, Circus Our Chaos, which was um, like in a kind of a crazy circus that toured the UK in the eighties, nineties. So um, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's that band. It was yeah. That's the band I was in. Mm, cool. Okay, well, that, that's quite a quite a crazy, crazy <laughs> backstory, really, isn't it? So, <laughs> you're a lecturer now, yeah? Um, kind of. I think, yeah. I I did. I've just actually done a lecture this morning with um PhD students at Bath Spa. So I kind of lecture research, but I'm I run or help to run a research program based on the concept of story. So it's based on using how businesses or organizations might explore the concept of story in loads of different ways. So that's my kind of um, main job. But I also, I do, um, I help to organize the Sidmouth Jazz Festival, the Sidmouth Cycle Campaign. I, you know, I play music and I'm a photographer. So I kind of, a mixture. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm de I'm debating whether to go full time with my job. I I enjoy some of all the other things around it, including writing. But I'm just like, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I quite like doing the three or four day week with the extra bits being the kind of like the extra fun stuff. 
yeah, I suppose, I suppose you've continued the eclecticism of the different music scenes, but yeah, in a kind of in a bit older way, perhaps. Yeah, I think that you learn that as a musician or as a producer. That is like maybe you just say yes to too many things, and then just kind of those things kind of snowball into something else and something else. Yeah. When you when you say you sort of done all these different kinds of music, jazz, mm. through to punk and so on, through to trip pop and all that kind of thing do you mm. sort of have an overview that it's all pretty much the same thing but with a different hat on or or do you see real sort of differences in the people and stuff you know I mean obviously the music sounds different but... yeah yeah um yeah I mean I think yeah definitely people I mean there's a lot a lot of it is just really supportive I mean most music scenes are very very supportive there's there's i mean the actual people themselves i think it's i think it could be i mean it's it's not easy being a musician yeah if you want to you know that's that's what i think when i with that quote you said at the start it's not if you're going to go to music school it's not it's not an easy kind of it's not an easy thing to choose being a musician because it's really really hard to make money so i think there's always an edge to being a musician like a fragility maybe amongst musicians which is why a lot of die die young drugs drink problems like that because it's like it's a calling for people and it's a kind of creative expression but it's it's really really difficult to make you know to make ends meet so i think it's that you know like i said i'm i'm still debating the, the you know how to balance the work life fun kind of elements now and i think it's i think that's an issue for 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 musicians growing up you know family pressures you've got university fee pressures you've got cost of living pressures all those things i think the cost of living pressures now are a lot harder for musicians than they maybe were in the in the 70s in general and 80s because you could kind of fall into things if you if you you know even if without any money you know, through squats, through the doll, yeah. through those kind of things. So, well, squatting and the doll were both in my world for for a while, mm. but, or more than a while with the doll. Oh, were they? Yeah, yeah. I was squatting in London and whereabouts? Uh, um, in Stoke Newington. Oh, so is my partner. Oh, really? What, what years? Uh, mid eighties, roughly. Okay. Yeah, she might be not. Yeah, she was nineties probably, but um, yeah. yeah. A small world. I know. And where I lived in Paris, it was called a Maison des Artistes. So it was literally, it was a squat, but it was because the French look after their musicians a little bit more. They kind of, they, they actually had a, you know, a big old building that they, that you, the musicians could squat kind of semi-legally. So they provided electricity and all those kind of things. And they, they knew we were there. There was no, real danger of getting kicked out because unless developers came um yeah that that must be brilliant i, I think yeah. that could that could make a really crucial difference just to have yeah. that extra little bit of security yeah and, and then you can be concentrating on being creative can't you rather yeah. than, rather than numbing the insecurities with the drink and drugs as you mentioned mm. don't talk about drink and drugs and music mm. sex and drugs and rock and roll if you like um yeah you you, you mentioned it in the context of artists having very kind of unstable situations mm. um is you, is that why you think there's so much connection between uh hedonism and music hedonism as in mm. the musicians themselves mm. um yeah i think it i think with with music though it is it is you are aiming for a kind of an ecstatic or a you are going somewhere aren't you like with it like if any i think music more than any art i would say really really affects your the resonance as a person and i think you can you can experience those kind of feelings as a musician at quite a young age and maybe there's something in there about kind of wanting to expand that or wanting to go even further with that which i think hedonism does does kind of you know does does come does come with you know when I'm when I was younger it was like to be creative it was either to you know you were people thought you should smoke 
joints or you could take heroin or it's like all kinds of different things that people thought ecstasy not maybe actually as a musician or maybe not ecstasy that's more of a punter kind of thing but i think those those kind of heading towards the flow state mm. that, you know um the flow state that you can get into as as a creative musician that it's it's almost like a shortcut through through drugs and i think it's and it's also that whole feeling about being on stage if you're if you're a musician who likes that being on stage it's a, that is a drug that is really difficult to kind of give up or mm. it's really difficult to um come down from as well so i think once you've been on stage like for a gig what happens afterwards at you know what you know what time are you finishing a gig you're finishing a gig at midnight one o'clock you know some gigs i used to just i stay in and then i go out and do a gig at one in the morning and it's like you're arriving at a venue when everyone else is drunk and you're like sober because you're performing and then you kind of perform and then you that that adrenaline you get from that it's like where do you go from there you know do you go home and have a cup of tea or do you just you know go out and have some fun and it's like yeah i think it's the it's that lifestyle you know the lifestyle of touring is really difficult and most people don't really like it even the ones that kind of you feel like they must like it i don't think many musicians really really like the touring kind of side of it because it's a quite boring and and it's a bit of a convey about you know you do the same thing a night after night after night after night and it's and I think it's just to, just to get through it. A lot of musicians will go to drugs just to get through that whole thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I, there's a, I read a really good quote about touring the other day, and I'm not going to remember it, but it was along the lines of, you know, the gigs are great, but the rest of it is just hell, basically. <laughs> yeah, I, I I really don't envy people that, that I don't, you know, I used to tour, and I and I quite like exploring different places, but it's... It, you don't really do much of that. You don't That's get to do that. Do you? You don't get it's to really do it. dark when you get there, usually, isn't it? Yeah. It was really different. In France, the touring thing was really different, though, because you'd, you'd arrive at a... I remember just the amount of gigs you'd arrive at, like, two in the afternoon, like, very civilised, and there'd be, like, a massive table of food, or you get taken to the local restaurant. So, you you know, you eat this, this, lo this load of food, and then you've got, like, a sound check, and then you're playing, like, about six hours later, and you're like... I mean, what are you you know if you you can sometimes just go out and explore places other people just go back to the hotel room then you go and play and it's like yeah there's there's so much downtime i suppose yeah yeah i guess so it yeah. really struck me when you were talking about that whole kind of buzz yeah yeah the, the big thing is what, what do you do when you get off stage you don't go home and have a cup of tea because because mm. your whole physiology is not geared to no. that at that point is it i suppose yeah no 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 it's still your mind your your body is still racing isn't it yeah 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 and mm. and it's a very powerful thing i think god mm. knows how much discipline you must need to, mm. to behave yourself after that. I, I never found out so i don't know um, uh, i'm good now very good yeah yeah I just, I just don't do those kind of gigs i mean to be honest i either play earlier or i just it's just i mean i think the thing is now i'm doing music for fun rather than money like you said about being a professional musician it's like it's why I don't I don't know. I mean, some people are professional musicians, but I'm I would consider myself like a semi, sometimes professional musician, maybe. Yeah, yeah. So, what? Well, how did you get into this whole university lecturer thing? Then it's a, that's a kind yeah. of thing, isn't it? Yeah, it was like um, I was working. I worked in music technology, kind of like for companies like. Um, turnkey and sound control so the companies that sell equipment and i got into that in the like the mid 90s and i just got bored of doing that and i just i've always been into education stuff so i kind of, when i was in glasgow i used to run a, a, school, a little self developed school for unemployed musicians in the studio teach them production get them in recording um and stuff like that so I started working as a mentor for New Deal for Musicians. And then I started, I was a technician at a few schools in just near Bristol. So I just, that's the first sort of way in. And then I became head of music at Bath College. Or I, I think I got a job first within the music department, then became head of head of music at Bath College. And that was really, really interesting. That was, 
I think I arrived at a time in the mid 2000s where because of the Labour, I think the Labour government had input quite a lot of money into FE and we arrived at Bath College. There's a few of us arrived there independently, didn't know each other. And we just hit it off and were quite, we were into kind of expanding the people that were learning music. So we were into kind of getting like the hip hop groups or we were into getting kind of like eclectic people who hadn't normally done music education at further education level into the into the college. And we were also interconnecting them with radio stations, studios, venues. So we created a whole kind of um, company within within the in the college called BA1 Records. So like Bath's postcode BA1 records. And yeah, so it was just students could do like um if you were like catering, you could do the food for a for like a gig, or you could do the set design, or you could do the marketing if you're in marketing, you could do photography, if you're in photography, you could do the art, you could do the album covers. You know, so we got the whole kind of like almost like the whole team, we had a whole team of people. I mean, we can because I came from industry. I couldn't believe that you could get these people for free. Basically, you can create mm. something like that for free. So, um, I just thought it was a no-brainer, and um, yeah, it was really successful to be honest. And it's I carried that on into a, a company called BIM, who are the British Institute of Modern Music, who are like an independent um, degree music um, college. And again, it's some of the same ideas I brought in. I brought into into BIM. So people yeah. like, yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty familiar with him. Um, George, e George Ezra was one of my, you know, George Ezra. So he was one of the st first students there. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm quite interested in, this possibly brings us back to the quote that I said at, at the start, really. Mm. My experience of music was, sort of broadly speaking, punk rock, but on a wider level, as part of the counterculture. Mm. Um, and... At the time, it seemed to me, the time being the sort of late 70s through the, the 80s, really, I suppose, it seemed to me that Bohemia or counterculture land or whatever, you, however you might kind of word that kind of thing, had absolutely nothing to do with any kind of state apparatus, i.e., oh, well, apart from being on the dole, of course. Mm -hmm. But um, but that it when BIM started and the... Mm. music based up in Liverpool as well and Liverpool, all these yeah. kind of things I, I was just quite shocked that I, that there could even be a suggestion that there could be any way you could teach the kind of stuff I was into yeah um, detect that you could any way you could teach it within uh, a formal environment right um, that, is, is that something you're looking at in your book because it seemed to hint that yeah yeah i why why were you surprised about that about that because that's a common that's quite a common response and i'm quite in, i'm quite intrigued um, sure well i left school at 16 to mm. go on the dole and do a fanzine and go and live in squats and be in a band mm. and all this sort of thing struck me as a very particular pathway mm. I, i'm i'm talking in hindsight here you know i, I don't necessarily mm. think this now I, i'm just curious i suppose so yeah, all, all of that counterculture stuff seemed to me when when similar people who were also into punk went off to university at mm. the same time, I sort of thought they were going straight a bit, truthfully, and you know, go, going back to what was expected of them a bit more, yeah. pleasing their parents and mm. sort of rejoining society more than I intended to. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I for for better or worse, I considered music. Or the rock and roll music, you know, from anything mm. from the hippies to the punks to the beatniks and all that kind of stuff. I considered all of that to to be something that operated very much on an artistic level. Um, and I was always dubious as to how much art you can be taught, truthfully. You can teach someone how to play a guitar. Mm. You can't teach someone how to write all you need is love or something. Yeah, yeah. No, I I I hundred percent agree, and that is that is really the premise of the book. Is that that I was always intrigued about why so many musicians came through art school. So, what was it about art school in that period from the sixties and seventies? 
And I had ideas, but I didn't really know. And I think the, the research I did for my PhD really kind of pinpointed where that really came from, coming from the Bauhaus, coming from a place called Black Mountain College in the States, coming from the 50s in America, the minimalist kind of music, Fluxus, John Cage, all that kind of stuff, quite a kind of punk avant-garde out there kind of kind of places but they were linked to colleges and education as well john cage taught at black mountain college you know i, I like the fact there's any, anyone called robert went to black mountain college in the states like robert um rauschenberg robert de niro robert motherwell um yeah all these roberts and there was a college which existed from 1933 to 1956 in the states they had a thousand students and virtually all of them became well known and it's like it was a kind of avant-garde place where the students and the tutors, they built the place together. They lived together. They kind of it was a very communal kind of thing. And a lot of these ideas were kind of fed into some elements of art school. And that radical flux to see kind of ideas filtered into some schools, like not many. I mean, there's about 100 and I think 120 art schools or something like that in the in the 60s in the UK. And about, you know, a few of them were quite radical. So where Brian Eno went at Ipswich, where Pete Townsend went at um, Ealing, Leeds had a real flux of thing, Newcastle. Um, there were little pockets, Hornsey, there were little pockets of really kind of punky kind of thing. And I think they these art schools fitted alongside these different kind of countercultures that were developing all around the UK, Liverpool, uh, Manchester, Bristol. I mean, and so it was almost side by side. You had these art schools and these cultural things come together. And the art, what I liked about some of the art school stuff I found out was that some of it was quite ra very, very radical, like very radical, you know, um, Ryan Eno's teacher was a guy called Roy Ascot. He lived, he used to live in Bristol. He now lives in Glastonbury and does a lot of work in China. He's 87. And he he basically taught Eno and um, Pete Townsend. But he had, he, you know, he used to have all these kind of concepts around about re sort of breaking down what art was. And it was like, it was the first sessions there weren't about painting. They were about kind of, they, they had to create, um, they were put into pairs and they had to create a kind of personality test. And so each pair had to create a, a this devise some sort of personality test. And they had to test all the personalities of the, the people in their class. And then those people had to kind of enact the opposite of this personality. So if Eno was very talkative, he wasn't allowed to talk for a term. Um, Pete Townsend was always moving around. So he was put in a trolley and he was moved around by someone else in a trolley. So it was it was this idea of, of concept and going against the the norm and challenging ideas about art, challenging the ideas whether you could teach art in an art school, basically. So it's actually challenging that concept in in the space where, you, where it is. And I think that's that's a really interesting thing. Loads of things came out of it, though. Loads of I think you can learn interconnections between disciplines and you can learn how certain conceptual elements, which you can then bring in to your art. I don't think you can learn. I don't think there's any point personally going to music school and learning how to play guitar. Uh, that was always my issue with places like BIM, because like all the musicians end up saying sounding the same. But you can look what I liked about art school is you can learn the concept of being an artist. You can learn the concept of being a musician. You can learn how you yourself could be this kind of this person. And I think that's that is why so many of those musicians really, really kind of, you know, hit home from 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 art school education. You know, um, that sounds like it would be mind blowing. And uh, I. I'd... For I some people, no, truth. I didn't know art schools were that radical. I knew some, that they produced, yeah. produced radical moments like the sort of mm. late sixties period, mm. like sit-ins and all that kind of stuff. But I didn't realise that there were there was radical thought going on from yeah. the teachers and stuff. That that's really really inspiring. But was mm. that a moment in time, or is that still a feasible thing now? That's a that's always the I've done a tour I did a tour for my book Blank Canvas uh, just for Christmas and that was the question that always came up and it was like I, it was a moment in time 
I do think some of those ideas can be brought in. I think it's 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 a moment in time. It's also a moment in your head as well. And I think it's you need to have the kind of trust of the people running institutes or running these things that really believe in the in the ideas. I think there's too many of those. The music colleges are very, very just. They're, they're almost they're like factories. It's the same every year. It's the same every year. It's the same every year. There's there's good stuff happening, but it's not really challenging at all. And I think you just you need to have people. The system is doesn't help, but I think somehow you need to have people that are willing to challenge concepts and ideas i think and it's it's that i i mean i know in my university at bath that the, even the the people who thought they were radical art teachers and it's always the art teachers think they're radical then had to think about their practice and then realized they weren't being radical and i think there's it's just that there is that conceptual idea it was definitely easier in the 60s and 70s because it was everything was new everything was fresh there were still a lot of hoops to jump through like you have nowadays and you did have that i think the the main thing is always going to be about finance you know i think you could experiment in the 60s and 70s in art school you know if if you and i were just kind of going like i don't really know what to do i could go to art school and see what it's like it doesn't really matter because you you know you're going to be financially fine whereas now if you did that you know you're going to be like 9500 quid in debt so yeah, it seems like it seems like economics has been used to shackle yeah people's freedom almost really well, I d- but i don't think that's always going to be the case i i really don't think that's always going to be the case. i think it's bloody obvious and i think it's like it, it only takes a change of not necessarily a change of government but a change of concept within government that 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 would be different you know universal income um again and uh, realizing the the importance of artists having that kind of that space it doesn't take you know a mega brain to really work that out so i i always believe that those things could happen again personally i don't think it's a continuum where it goes like that i think it just goes in waves so it was a moment in time that time will come again possibly i i, I do hope i do hope you're right it's, it's nice to hear well it has to be doesn't it really otherwise you just you know it's like saying that music hasn't isn't any good anymore it's like yeah there's some some thing behind that but it's also the fact that it, that's also not quite true either and it's like and things in the future that's going to change as well you know there will be new music there will be new ideas there will be new punk there will be new jungle there will be new grime and stuff like that in the future so will there be new cultural movements which is essentially yeah. what those things were because that's that's obviously yeah. those things existed way beyond music didn't they you know there was a yeah. whole there was a whole package of which music yeah. was just a part, really. Because yeah. yeah, you could also look at, at the whole kind of cult, uh, youth move, youth cults, as yeah. a moment yeah. from perhaps the Teddy Boys to mm. whenever you decide the cut-off point is. Um, yeah. In terms of having kind of any mass effect, it, I, I'm probably I'm probably going to come over as a bit of an old fart here, quite frankly, because I don't keep up with new music. Um, yeah. I just don't have any interest in doing that, and. Um, so I don't really know, but it seems to me that a lot of youngsters these days, when they kind of feel a bit different, feel like they don't fit in, the sort of people who may have gone to art school, perhaps, mm. or got into being a hippie or a punk or even a teddy boy or whatever, it seems that those people now, from from my far off mm. vantage point, not knowing any young people, it seems that they buy into retro stuff, mm. you know, that you still get teenagers becoming goths or becoming mm. punks or becoming... Uh, yeah ever you know nirvana fans and so on and so forth am, am i anywhere near the truth there bearing in mind you know young people and i don't i know some young people um i think that's i think there's a natural retro mania i think that's a natural it's a book by simon reynolds it's very good um there's a natural position to that but i think it's i think you have to look across cultures basically that might be true across some of our cultures in the UK. Um, you know, I think I, I really think there's a really strong black movement in music. There's a really strong cultural music in Asia, um, in Eastern Europe, in South America. Um, and, you know, I think there's there's loads of it's, it's such a mash 
of different cultures. There is loads of amazing music going on. I think it's just, I think there's actually so much music that, that you just can't see it or you can't be bothered to see it. And I, I think, um, and the problem is with what used to happen was the good music used to be really easy to find. It was the stuff that was in front of you. And people like John Peel, Annie Nightingale, um, all those kind of people, um, they, they, you know, Kid Jensen, <laughs> Kid Jensen, possibly. Yeah. They used to cut, yeah. 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 He was yeah, all let's, right. Let's be generous. <laughs> Janet, Janice Long. Um, they used to actually, those gatekeepers, in a way, had an easy job because you had like a really defined, this is pop really and this is the other stuff and they they and they were given airtime to do that whereas now there are those kind of djs there are those kind of things but it's it's just so confused the boundaries between pop other music and you've got all that retro stuff and yeah i don't know i think it's i think personally there is too much looking back and I, I quite, I mean, I'm quite a forward-looking kind of musician. So I, I'm, I've always been like that. And I quite like fu future concepts and future ideas. And there's, I think there's, a, I like a lot of stuff on the classical music, electronic music boundary, which I think is really, really interesting. And that's very cross, you know, across different um, global perspectives as well. And I think, yeah, yeah. Although I must say that my daughters are probably into quite retro stuff, really. Well, my youngest one is, but not my older one. Mm, mm. That's interesting. I think it seems to me that one of the big changes because of the internet has been um, that music doesn't get a chance to coalesce like it used to. Mm. Uh, you know, yeah. there's, in a way, everything that the punk rock DIY ethos fought for is here, but what a pyrrhic victory it turns out to be because anyone can put mm. a song on youtube but getting more than five people to listen to it is, is this the unforeseen issue yes yeah. Uh, yeah and yeah uh, no, the, the internet is again that was another thing that came up in some of my talks was that the internet i i find it's really interesting you know the internet it's like i love coming from that area pre, that era pre-internet because i think it's really fascinating being born in an era pre-internet and post-internet. I can't imagine what it's like to be born, born just post-internet. You don't know anything before the internet. And yeah. if I had in my own music college, I'd, I would definitely have an element of no internet there. I would have a kind of trying to reconnect with kind of natural kind of connections rather than electronic kind of connections. I think there is a, but it's a really difficult one because there's a lot of kind of emancipation happening because of the internet. You know, there's a lot of kind of, you can find out anything you can you know knowledge there's so much knowledge there's a much more power because of the knowledge for loads of people who wouldn't have the knowledge before you think the boundaries to knowledge before were so massive if you didn't have like a good upbringing whereas mm. now that's not really the case you know most people can browse the internet even from you know even if you're really poor you tend to be able to somehow find yourself that information oh, so yeah. Yeah. yeah, I lived in the library when I was younger, and uh, yeah, that, that was a small library, so it's quite limited. I, I still love library. I mean, I I think it's I think it's those. Yeah, I mean, I live in Devon in a small town, and I just love going to the little library, and it's buzzing. And I think that's there's something about that connection which you don't get on the internet. It's just not as wholesome. It's not as wholesome a space base as the internet is. It always feels very very fast very very there's no there's no kind of tactile element about it so you know the, the tactile thing you have with an lp or a tape or a mini disc or a that those great things you don't get that with a product you don't get that with anything so for a young person nowadays it must be like god you know, i mean the retro thing is so kind of tempting because it is actually physical there is a physical you know otherwise it's just like it's just something there you know you might have your kind of uh i you know you've got your kind of ear pod ear pods or you've got your kind of phone computer and of course the the whole economy of music has changed as well hasn't it ever since downloads became available yeah. so therefore these kids at bim or wherever um, yeah 
they, they've got to try and survive in a world where making money from being a musician is harder than ever. I suppose. Yeah. There's, I don't know how, I don't think that, I mean, that's what I don't like about those places as well, is that I don't believe there is a career in music that you can go through that way. You can have a career in music by being a brilliant artist. You can have a career in music by being a brilliant at marketing. You can have a career in music by being, you know, great at one of those elements of the music industry. But, you know, yeah, there's to make money as a musician was always hard, like was always really hard, but it's like, it's a lot easier then than it is now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I in, interviewed um, Stephen Malander from Cabaret Voltaire, and he was just like, you have to remember in the 70s, there weren't any bands. I mean, if you're in a band, you basically got signed. Because if you could get it together to get your mates together and actually create some music, you know, there were so few bands that the record companies would kind of like sniff you out straight away. So whereas nowadays, obviously, you know, there was something like 60,000 albums released a day. Really? Yeah. That's insane, isn't it? It's insane, isn't it? And if you think, yeah, it's mad. It's just crazy. But that that's because <laughs> it's because you got you know, if you've you got worldwide, like you say, you can release an album like that. You can just go, I'll just do it. I just put it on the internet. There's no there's no way, you know, there need I think there needs to be some way of of just reducing that. I don't know how you do it though. I don't know how you do it. Well, the genie's out of the bottle to some extent, I would say. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I've all, like you say, it's always that punk thing about everyone can be a musician is really, really good. It's And, yeah. I think that's why people go for retro, because it's like, well, I just can't be bothered listening to, like, a million new things. I'm just going to listen to the thing that people recommended from the past. I remember reading the Yippie Manifesto, Jerry Rubin and Nabi Hoffman and so on. Yeah. And they were talking about a society where, where we were all freed from work because let the machines do it, which of course is slowly but surely happening. Or yeah. The way they envisage. They yeah. envisage this future where we could all be free of work and then we could all discover our own inner artists and so on. Oh. And, and I thought that sounded rather wonderful, really, particularly the bit about not working, which I've <laughs> tried to keep to. And, yeah, um, good. And, and but the, th the whole kind of thread or spirit running through that, I think, is freedom essentially. And yeah. I, I don't see freedom uh, manifesting in sixty thousand albums a day. I see a desperation and a neediness for attention and mm. and this kind of thing. It just doesn't feel as positive as it should have done, you know. No, no, but it, you know, if it, but people are creatively releasing their kind of expression, artistic expression. Well, that's absolutely fine. I think it's. I've been reading a lot at the moment about um, Chat GT, that the the robot. I've been using it a lot. Not for have you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> have you? What have you been using it for? Uh, writing articles and just seeing how well they can be written. I'm not using it in an active way, but I'm investigating yeah. a lot how good it is basically and i'll tell you yeah. what it's pretty good it's pretty good yeah it's a bit wikipedia like but at the moment i think but it's from what i've well from what i can gather it seems a little bit wikipedia it writes like it's a little bit wikipedia and it lets but it's good yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's yeah there's a lack of humanity and there's a lack of personality yeah. but but you know if you wanted to sort of put together a textbook on something then you probably wouldn't need to give it much of a proofread, quite frankly. No, no, no. And it's, you know, you could get it done in a few days. Yeah, and this is this is kind of the way the future is, isn't it? Whether we yeah. like it or not. And clearly there's a lot to not like about yeah. it. And this I, almost ties in with music, doesn't it, really? It does. And I think it's like you say about the genie out of the bottle. You just, it, There needs to be some way of really maximising how it's used because it's a really it could be a really, really good thing. What I like about imagine like lawyers, you know, lawyers doing all spending hours writing papers and doing all that thing. You know, this kind of thing is just going to do that for them. You can yeah. see that's not that far ahead. You know, lawyers are going to be like, oh, my God, what do we do? Um, Can't help a little smile at that thought. Yeah. I know. I quite <laughs> like that. I really like that thought. But it's true, isn't it? You think that's one of those professions where really it's just a few 
rules that they're going to learn and then yeah the robot is going to be able to kind of like really get to grips with that mm, mm. i think yeah i think i think it's really interesting in in education higher education because i think a lot of universities are really worried at in the small in the short term obviously you know you can write an essay using chap gt and you get a pretty good grade probably um yeah. Yeah. at undergraduate degree level so um i think there's you know I think it's a really good thing to use and to and as a starting point and then you can manipulate it and you can change it yourself. I'm going to start doing that. I'm going to definitely look at what how it writes and what, how it brings ideas together and see if that gives me another perspective on something. I think it will change how um, universities assess work. I think they will have to do things which are much more personalised. So you'll have to do a lot more kind of talking and to camera or to to questions or to pencil <laughs> there's also yeah. a connection here you're saying you're a music producer which obviously i take to mean that you used a lot of music software yeah um, hardware in the old days uh, yeah sure um that was also letting the machines do it and it was also met with a great deal of resistance yeah um, yeah yeah. And so there seems to be a sort of a cycle here, really, yeah. a psychological cycle, at least. Yeah, you know, definitely. new stuff comes in, old people don't like it, yeah. and, but tough because it's happening anyway, essentially. Yeah, yeah no, definitely. The, yeah, the software thing was definitely, yeah, definitely that. I mean, it was, yeah, I, I remember when samplers first came out. So, you know, you've got the 80s, you've got the kind of Fairlight samplers that people like Trevor Horn was using with Frankie Goes to Hollywood and um, Grace Jones and all those kind of artists and it was like the musicians were going like oh my god you know we're gonna we're gonna be out of business we're never gonna have any work and it just wasn't didn't happen it didn't happen it was just like it was just another tool another thing that if you knew how to use it right it just it kind of expanded the idea of what you could do with music what you could do with sound what you could do with time because what you used to do in the old days was like you used to spend, you used to sample something and it used to take you hours. Now it's like two seconds, you know, and it, that's the, it's a massive difference. And I think it's just it just gets you somewhere. It's probably why you've got 60,000 albums a day, because it's so quick. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that that's where the problem is. And you could have like 60,000 essays done on Nietzsche as well which are pretty good and that's the problem but it's how you kind of compartmentalize or find the good stuff or how that is kind of filtered that's the that is the that is the issue it's also a move towards conformity isn't it because if you have sixty thousand essays on nature that it's very unlikely any of them are going to say anything controversial or different yeah and so on and that kind of yeah. ties in with with everything else doesn't it the way everything is sort of coalescing around mm. radical thought like it used to in art schools or youth, youth cults yeah kind of coalescing around the center yeah i think but i think there is still radical thought it's just maybe it's a bit too right rather than left um <laughs> god yeah that, yeah i suppose you're right yeah. yeah i mean it's yeah i still think there's a place for i think there is a place for radical thought actually on both on all on all sorts of sides but um yeah yeah, I think you're right. Like the more you have a mass of things doing the same thing, the more it goes to the center, the more things become kind of less distinct, the more things are just, yeah, become very, very samey, very similar. It's probably why the world should just kind of explode and we can start again, really. Well, Cheery. Cheery it might podcast. be closer than we think then, might Oh, yeah, it might be closer than we think. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm trying to find way. I think with the robot or the chat GT thing, I think it's there is there is definitely positives, but I think you know somehow it has to be kind of. Um, I've seen people in HE already embracing it in a good way, and I think that's quite that's really positive. Mm, mm. Yeah, it's it's a very bizarre thing. I've been using it just for a laugh, really, for art as well. So I did, uh, yeah, and I did draw. Draw me a picture of David Bowie as a punk rocker in Cubist style. And and it came out with stuff that was way better than any I could do. Not that I'm an artist yeah. anyway, but but I felt quite dirty, you know. I felt like I was yeah. being pretty dishonest, really. <laughs> so it's it's a sort of weird sort of psychological relationship with it as well. How do you yeah. see it being used positively then? 
Yeah, absolutely. Because it's because it's about the concept, isn't it? You're the one who's giving it the concept. And if everyone said like, do David Bowie in a Cubist style, it's yeah. In a way, it's like being a producer. You go like, I really want that sample from that 1960s record. You're the person. I'm the person going. I want that sample from that 1960s record. No one else is. Yeah. I'm gonna okay. You know, if the the the, the robot's going to automate it, but then it's up to you to kind of create to make the originality within that. Because if you're just doing that, then everyone everyone can spot. Generally, you can spot when it's just automated. Like like within music, if people just kind of chuck in samples, it doesn't sound great, and most people can see that. Whereas if there's a lot of thought or there's real kind of context or there's real kind of subtlety or there's real kind of other things put in there, I think it just, there's more, um, yeah. I think people, I think people do recognize that. I think people are, I think people are definitely cleverer than they're kind of like uh, people are made out to be. Perhaps they recognize it on a subconscious level. Yeah, definitely. The connection, isn't it, ultimately music? Yeah, and yeah I think, I think people do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what do you what do you teach your students then? What what do you try and get in their heads? How to find chat GT no. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Give them the website and then go on with it. <laughs> Give them the website and just go with it. Um yeah, yeah. No, I I am very much about kind of um self like finding the self yourself, finding how to be creative in collaborative groups, how to explore i mean my book's called blank canvas the idea is to kind of go seeing what you can produce without maybe without thought as well sometimes about that i I do a lot of writing where it's done without thought like automatism kind of ideas so i try to get people to really explore where their true creative kind of side is is what i'm really most interested in and breaking trying to get away from tropes or getting away from their normal kind of routines like what Roy Ascot was doing with Brian Eno and um Pete Townsend that's that in a way that's my natural position you know as a trombone player I play in jazz but I don't like most jazz because a lot of it is like loads of wiggly notes and I'm a punk trombone player so I like just one note you know, <laughs> if I can make one note I've done that before with jazz in jazz groups where you get like a saxophone player going and I just go Bruh. And I think, oh yeah, that was quite a good note, though, wasn't it? That was yeah. back. I I just I like minimalist stuff anyway. Mm. So I think yeah, with students, a lot of that is about that, about taking away things. So about minimalism. Um, it could be in their writing, or it could be in their music, or it could be in their photography, anything like that. It's about how yeah, how to, reduction, I suppose, taking things out. Mm. Mm. That yeah. is quite quite a punk thing ultimately i suppose yeah. that is quite a punk thing because yeah if you can you know the, you know the old one chord was, was really three chords and it's like that is that is really punk that is like you don't really you know the most punk was john cage's four minutes 33 that's like it doesn't yeah. get more punk ultimate. than yeah that's yeah. the ultimate <laughs> that's the ultimate punk record yeah. although he never recorded it it was like yeah maybe that's the fact he didn't record it either that's even more punk so it's like it can be it can be performed in any way any way that you want do you feel free to disseminate radical ideas in when you're teaching in, in the current climate i suppose yeah because i think the thing is about universities you can you still can have that i mean i know in some universities there's probably some sort of control somewhere but i think in universities are still a place where you can actually just talk about the stuff that you're interested in and the stuff that you that you find so if it's radical it's great you know i think there's definitely where i am at bath spa there's there'll be a lot of teachers who have a you know will have radical ideas or they will have ideas away from the norm that just encourage students to explore explore definitely so um yeah i think i think so you, you know I did do one session where I stood up in front of the class and I just stood silent for four minutes 33 and that was pretty radical. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> yeah, one of, one of the students threw a can at another student. I think someone else started crying and a few walked out and it's like, so I can't, I mean, that is the extreme in that it's kind of, you know, 
you can't do that all the time. Otherwise, you lose all your class. Sure, yeah, yeah. But I do, but I think it, I, when you said what you do with your students, I do get them to try and take over the class and to kind of like do the things that they're, they're, they're interested in, what they want to do. And I'm the kind of, I can lead them or I can suggest ideas. One, I remember one term, I didn't plan anything, say like 10 sessions. It was all about culture and music. And I didn't plan anything. And all I did was like, wait to see who died that week and then to do something about them. Because right. you realise that every week, like, key musicians will die. And it was like, you know, it was um, Keith Flint from um, The Prodigy. There was uh, Mark Hollis from Talk Talk. There was, um, you know, you get, there was someone from uh, from The Beat. Yeah, so you, you basically get, like, you can you can just mix and match culture just by just by one idea, by saying, who like, you know, who died this week? You sound like the kind of teacher where if I'd had a teacher like you at school, I might have gone on to further education. And uh, did which leads me to wonder how many people like you are there in in the education system. Are you are you uh, an outlier, or is it is there a healthy amount? <laughs> um, I think we're all individual. I think we're all individuals as we are. Um, yeah, I think there's probably less over time. I think there's still probably teachers of my i think that is that point about the era that i was born in there are teachers of my age who who will have some of those you know who will be like that um i think it's i don't know if the teachers coming through now will be the same i think that's the problem that's probably the worry i'd say mm. you know it will become a bit homogenized you know and I think it, you know, you reflect your, your cultures that you were born in, don't you? And at the moment, there aren't those social, those kind of subcultural groups. Um, yeah. 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 And I had it, you know, I naturally, I, I'm just naturally like that through being a producer and playing in punk bands. That's, and that, I haven't changed anything from that to how I teach, really, you know. What's it like being a producer? Because that's something I've got no... Uh, evidence of at all really i loved it yeah i was i was only like i was only a record producer in studios for a couple of years i basically let when i left france my girlfriend and i we kind of like we put a pin in a map of where we wanted to go and it had to be english speaking because we were sick of speaking french yeah. and she put a pin in edinburgh and i put a pin in glasgow and so we ended up kind of, you know, deciding between we ended up in glasgow and I studied um, music production at the School of Audio Engineering in Glasgow. I just got, I got into it in France, the whole production thing, because they're so mad on production in France. I just really got into that, you know, sleeping in the studio situation. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I got into, I learned about it in Glasgow and I got a job, you know, it's in the mid 90s. I got a job straight away. No experience. You know, it was that classic kind of like someone's off in, you know, ill today. I hear you can you can you know how to produce a band and I'm going like uh yeah <laughs> and you just take a risk and I think that that is that is what came through my book is a lot of those people would take risks and that I just I naturally took that risk because I didn't really care if it didn't go <laughs> go well that much um and I think that's I think that's the point um but I loved it because you got you got the control of a of the whole sound thing i still do a lot of um i i think I, i'll probably i'll probably get into music production more in like maybe a few years time when i've when i you know i think i'll do it again mm. i mean i i write electronic music and i you know i play in bands and i i just like the fact as a producer you can control every you can you have the whole sonic palette like as a trombone player you just play a silly brass instrument yeah. Whereas as a producer, you can you can just kind of like mold and shape the whole the whole thing. So, yeah, yeah, I love and I I like the fact I like working with musicians as well. So it's just yeah, blimey, <laughs> I used to anyway. Yeah, no, I do, I do actually. Yeah, I, I think I think musicians are, are gen I, generally they're very. I think musicians tend to be quite conservative and quite quiet. Um. I must get the wrong ones. Then. I know it's weird, isn't it? I do. Oh, there's something about, yeah, maybe I have as well. There's something, yeah, I do think they're quite conservative musicians in general. That's but, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Compared to artists, 
Um, when you're writing blank, blank canvas, has, has it changed you from start to finish? I, mm. I've written a couple of books and they both changed me, mm. not, not in massive ways or anything, but yeah. did you notice any change in your attitudes, for instance, to anything? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I don't, I don't know if I did. <laughs> maybe. Um, I think, I think it maybe kind of focused my my mind on certain things or my my head on certain things. I mean, a lot of the things was about the process of art creation. So, one of my chapters is called process, and I think it's really central to everything that that concentration on the process. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it actually changed me, but um, I think it maybe changed my idea that I like writing, that I am I see myself more as a writer than I... I didn't think I was a writer when I started it. I think I see myself as a writer now I've finished it. Right, yeah. Maybe you need to do that. To, but I, I, I write every day, so like every day I probably wake up to annoyance my partner about six o'clock and I write for an hour. Okay. Every day. And that's usually just a stream of consciousness or it's a kind of like or ideas towards the book that I'm writing or if I'm doing like, you know, anything that I'm writing, I will I will write towards it. And yeah, I just like I like that free writing time. So that's it's probably changed me that in that way in that it's kind of almost given me that structure to writing every day, mm. you know, and that's a, the thing I like about writing over music production. Music production is so time consuming you just lose hours and days and you know just doing it whereas yeah when i was in when i was in glasgow as a producer my girlfriend at the time was was in africa and she was coming back and we meant to meet in glasgow this um somewhere in glasgow and i just didn't make it because i was in the, in the middle of doing a session and i realized about a day later that i hadn't i hadn't met her i was just so so, yeah. I, I know that feeling you look up and it's three in the morning and you think how did that happen yeah yeah music music production is so like that you need i think it's that's why really it's either a young person's game or it's a retired person's game because it's or it's someone who's professionally paid to do it because it's like you know a few of my friends i know have talked about starting to do music production i'm like that's fine but you can't have you got the time and, and you know and it's like it's such it is a that is a drug it's a real real drug of kind of because you you know you spend hours on one little bit and it sounds brilliant and you're trying all these different things and blah 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 and then it's six in the morning and you're meant to you got to go to work and it's like the kids are waking up or it's like yeah yeah so this new book would be a good place yeah. i think probably to, to wrap it up so do you want to tell us have you, has he have you got a deal for it? Has it got a title? No, I haven't actually. But I, I mean, the, the deal for my last book was with a academic publisher, Intellect. And I I might use them, but I, I'm quite interested in trying to just write a a book that's a little bit more creative in some ways. So just less, much less academic, basically. Blank Canvas is like, it's academic, but it's also populist thing. But it's like the new one, I think it's going to be called Resonance. And it's about creative um, resonance of creative scenes. And I think it's, yeah, I want it to be just a fun kind of autobiographical, but also bringing in some depth about what it is to that makes scenes so kind of um, successful. You know, um, Enos, uh, Eno called something senius. So like the genius of scenes is called a senius. Yeah. And I really, that it's about that idea about how, collective people can come together and i'm looking at kind of from african kind of um, villages to south american kind of or indian tribes and groups and how that and to, to techno raves to bands to families how that resonance between groups of people really really develops the creative creative stuff um so yeah resonance I was reading something interesting putting forward the thesis that blues came from African shamanistic music. Oh yeah. And and, they, and these kind of big rituals they had with musical backgrounds. Then through slavery they all relocated, well 
various mm. options, relocated to America and the Blues Code. So you could also trace back, if you wanted to go down that route, the whole of sort of rock and roll, etc., to shamanism and tribes and so on, which is quite... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, you can. You can, yeah, you can definitely, um, yeah, you trace it back. I mean, I, for me as well, I, I don't actually see, like, a lot of people will see modern music as coming from the blues, and I see it as coming from minimalism. Just really? because you... Because I see it as going through that minimalism went to like um, that kind of uh, thing you had in punk, had in um, post-punk, had in new wave, that kind of minimalist, broken down feel that you have in blues. But I, I just see it as a direct connection more more to the kind of um, the minimalist thing. So, so I think you can follow all kinds of different um, things. There's, there's a book by a jazz saxophone player called Stephen Alexander and he looked at how jazz and the resonance of the earth scientifically kind of connected together so how different kind of like phrases I think he mainly looked at not Charlie Parker um I can't remember. anyway but he yeah he looked at how resonance of how jazz kind of structures works so how how the how the earth resonated so I'm yeah I mean I love stuff like that basically. So do I. So do I. I'm absolutely fascinated by the, the yeah frequency, solfeggio frequencies and all that kind of thing. Yeah and, yeah yeah yeah. yeah. Uh, I've no idea how much uh, substance there is in it, but it's a fascinating. I, yeah yeah yeah. But I think there's something about the group resonance about that group. Like when that whole thing in like um like in tribal in tribal kind of groups that whole thing about collective dance and collective song and collective thing where there wasn't this thing about anyone being a musician or anyone being an artist it's just that there was a natural kind of feel in the in the rhythmic makeup that people that people had and that would have very much connected with nature the natural sounds they're hearing around them what they feel as a resonance because they were much more connected to their surroundings than we are Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, I think, I think there's that. That's what I love about music is that natural. I mean, I do a lot of field recording. So I'm, I live by the sea in Devon and I kind of do a lot of like recording different bays, the birds, wind, nature. And yeah, so I'm into all that. Into yeah, okay. that kind of... Like the Cabaret Voltaire dude, in fact. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I've always, I've always been into that. Yeah, field recording stuff. Oh, what do yeah, you do Chris, that, then? I'm, I make electronic music. So I make electronic music under the name of Inochi, which means life energy in Japanese. Right. Um, yes, and I, it's, I just yeah, I, I've always I've always created music from those from those kind of sounds really. So I'll check that out. I'm, I'm quite fascinated by the whole con concept concept of all that. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Brilliant. Okay, I think that's 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 probably a great place to leave it, Simon. So I'll just finish right. up saying, if people want to buy your book, it's called Blank Canvas. It's on Intellect Books, and and if they just Google those two things, they shall find it. Basically, I would, I would say, wouldn't they? Yeah, definitely. Blank Canvas, Doctor Doctor Strange as well. If you want to look, if you just <laughs> Doctor Simon Strange rather than Doctor Stephen Strange, that that would be me. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Is there a Doctor Stephen Strange? Then? Well, Doctor Strange from the Marvel comics is Doctor Stephen Strange. Oh, I see. Right. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking of Steve Strange from. Yeah, yeah. There's Steve Strange from that. But there's Doc. Yeah, Doctor Stephen Strange. Yeah, as well. Lots of strange people about. Lots of strange people about. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, thank you for being one of them. Thank, and you, thank you very much for your time. And yeah, I'll stop here. But I'll have a little chat with you afterwards. Thank you. Great. Cheers. Thank you.